Good evening, I'm Giovanni Zenalda, the director of the Duke Center for International Global Studies and of the Rifinki Diplomacy Program. Welcome to this uh, uh, webinar. This is the second webinar in a series called Multi-Stakeholder Framework Series. And uh, we are delighted to have a special guest, uh, Professor Peter Jones uh, from the Ottawa Dialogue and University of Ottawa. Uh, the uh, moderator of, for this event is our uh, fellow uh, Ambassador Pearson, and uh, he will introduce uh, Professor Jones and uh, he will also moderate the beginning of the discussion. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, of course, and uh, again, uh, Prof uh, Ambassador Pearson will uh, tell us a little bit more about this, given his experience as on the uh, official diplomatic side. And uh, I would like to uh, say thank you to all the um, staff support who have been involved in the production of this uh, event. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, thank you to the Trent Foundation for supporting the Rethinking Diplomacy Program. Um, Ambassador Pearson. Thank, thank you, uh, Giovanni. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here with uh, all of you today for what's going to be a very interesting discussion. And I know that I'm looking forward to it. You know, we all recognize that the increasing complexity of global problems and the concurrent involvement of more people and more stakeholders and a good outcome uh, has encouraged the expansion of non-official dialogues to help address some of these very difficult issues. And these informal processes, some people call this track diplomacy, uh, may have a greater and greater role in helping to reach lasting solutions world is growing smaller and the need for effective communication across cultural, political, economic, and other barriers is steadily expanding. And in that respect, I am delighted to uh, introduce Dr. Peter Jones today. Uh, Dr. Jones holds a PhD in war studies from King's College London and a master's in war studies from the Royal Military College of Canada. Uh, before joining the University of Ottawa, he served as a senior analyst for the Security and Intelligence Secretariat of the Privy Council of Canada. And previously, he held various positions related to international affairs and security at the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Privy Council Office, and the Department of Defense in Canada. He is an expert on security in the Middle East and track to diplomacy. He led the Middle East Security and Arms Control Project at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute in Sweden in the 1990s. And he is presently leading several track two initiatives in South Asia and the Middle East, and is also widely published on Iran. He is an acknowledged global expert on track diplomacy. We're delighted to have him with us. After he completes his remarks as moderator, I will offer the first couple of questions, and then Dr. Zanalda will offer up questions that come up on the chat list from the viewing audience. So with that said, uh, Dr. Jones, we welcome you and we turn the program over to you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction, Ambassador Pearson, and uh, my thanks also to the Center for International and Global Studies and the Rethinking Diplomacy Project for, for giving me this opportunity. Let me put up some slides here uh, quickly, and uh, there we are. Um, so what I would like to do with the, with the brief time I have today is to really do two things. First of all, to, to review the history of Track 2 a little bit and sort of the concepts of what it is. Uh, and, and I won't spend too much time on that. I'm very happy to talk about it in the Q&A. But, but really, the second thing I want to do is the most important thing, I think, and that is to speak about where I think the field is going, because I think there are some interesting developments um, um, which are challenging the field and which are potentially leading to some splits that I think we need to think about and discuss. So um, the first point I would make by way of some general history, if I can just advance the slide here, there we are, is that track two is not new. I mean, the idea of bringing together influential citizens from societies in, in conflict or with difficulties has been around for a very long time, prior to World War I, between the wars, during the Cold War. So it's not new uh, in the sense of, of, of uh, sort of discussions between influential private citizens about international affairs. 
Um, what is new, and I think in our field of track two, what we tend to refer to as the first example of the kind of work we do, um, really comes from a gentleman named John Burton, who was an Australian, although he spent much of his working life in Britain and the US, a former official who then went into academic life. And he um, was interested in, in whether or not there might be ways to resolve conflicts beyond the sort of the methodologies and the, the ideas that were prevalent in the mid 1960s. And so drawing on some advances in the social sciences around problem solving in a different variety of fields of social work, healthcare, and so on, he, he developed an idea that you could bring together people from societies in conflict, not officials, uh, not there to negotiate, but to uh, step back from their official portfolios and from their government positions and to try to uh, explore the underlying causes of the dispute. He'd call controlled communication. And this was a methodology where you had a third party facilitator whose job was to try to draw the sides out on the underlying causes of the dispute and to get them to stop just trading positions and to really begin to, to analyze it and really to move to what he called a problem solving mode of interaction rather than bargaining. So what we mean by that is uh, viewing the issue between them as a problem which they jointly have to analyze and then jointly solve rather than bargain over. Um, and so this was the first real um, ex uh, example of the sort of the application of a, a social science based methodology to the task of bringing together people from societies in conflict and facilitating the dialogue in a certain way. And really, in many ways, we regard it as the beginning of all this uh, effort we now call track two diplomacy. Um, a number of people have contributed greatly to the field. I'll talk about some of them in a minute. But the person who gives us the name track two diplomacy was a gentleman named Joseph Montville. And he was an American Foreign Service officer who was interested in these informal discussions that seemed to be going on uh, around the world, started by Burton, but then others were, were becoming involved in them. And he wanted his diplomatic colleagues to take note of them and to try to understand them. And so in his writings and thinking, he came up with this term to try to sort of define them called track to diplomacy. And this is the definition he gave, which in many ways is still the classic definition. And I, I leave it up on the screen there for a moment, just so you can have a look at it, because that's what we call track two. Now, as we'll see in a minute, track two encompasses a number of different kinds of activities. It's a rather broad field. And so over the years, a number of people who've been active in the, in the field have sort of expanded the definitions. And they put forward uh, other sort of ideas, and, and each one of these um, um, concepts has a particular definition to it, a particular set of understandings of what it is. I won't go through them in, in detail, but I'm happy to talk about them later. But just to make the point that track two really exists on a number of different levels in a number of different ways. And so one way to try to sort of capture all of this complexity and nuance is this sort of diagram, which different versions of it appeared over the years. This is mine. And, and this is not meant to be hierarchical. It's not meant to suggest that track one is on the top and everything else feeds into or some things are subordinate. It's just a way of representing the idea that, that you have this sort of track one official diplomacy. And then what is sometimes known as track one and a half, which is mediation and dialogue between decision makers. These could be officials in their private capacities, as we say in the track two world, or they could be uh, private citizens, but very influential people who are close to their governments. Um, then you have track two, which is influential elites, but somewhat further removed from government. And it's about dialogue and some training. And then there's this whole area called track three, which is quite broad, dialogue, training, advocacy, empowerment, and it takes place on the grassroots and local level. And, and much of the discussion in the field is going on now about how track three and track one and a half, track two interact. Uh, over the years, there have been a variety of different um, discussions about that, but we'll get to that in a moment because that's where the, the interesting ideas are right now. Another way to represent what I've talked about and sort of look at all these different definitions over the years that have come out is this one. Um, and so on the left-hand side is official diplomacy. And then there's a sort of a sliding scale towards the right, moving further and further away from official diplomacy to down to what would be called track three at the far end. And there's a bit of a dotted line because to some extent, the, the objective of most track two, most of the major categories, is to try and in a way support track one, to try and come up with agreements or ideas that will be useful to official diplomacy in terms of solving disputes. But when you get down towards track three, there are arguments that no, we should in fact be trying to, to uh, uh, take, it should take matters in a transformative direction. Uh, 
and change matters. Uh, we'll come back to that. Anyway, if you look at all these different definitions and you read all the books and all the articles, which I've had the pleasure of doing over the years, you come up with a certain set of takeaways, sort of what are the key, key elements of what we call track two and what most people understand track two to be. So I'll spend a minute on those. We're going to call the recurring themes. The first is that they're small informal dialogues. We call them problem solving workshops. And they're usually facilitated by an impartial person who plays the role of the third party or the facilitator. And that's the role that I play and other people play. And many of those who wrote those various definitions play that role of third party. Um, the dialogues are unofficial, but it's expected that everybody there has some influence at home, access to decision makers. Now that doesn't mean that they have to have influence to track one. They might have influence if they're down at the further end of the scale towards track three. Their influence might be that they have you know, grassroots followings, they have an ability to connect to the media, but one way or the other, they have influence. And they're taking the ideas they learn in these dialogues home and, and spreading them into their society. Thirdly, the dialogues are, are not places where the current positions are to be debated, but places where they step back and try and engage in this problem solving mode. And it's very much the job of the third party to, to make sure that that happens and to guide and direct the conversation down that, down that track. It's not easy to do sometimes. Another set of recurring themes is that um, these are ongoing processes. They last sometimes for years. I mean, there's a gentleman at Harvard named Herbert Kelman. He's, he's retired now, but he ran, he began running Israeli-Palestinian workshops in the 1970s. And he ran them all the way through the 70s and the 80s and into the 90s. And many of the ideas that came out at the end in the Oslo agreements really arose from his track twos, but he ran them for many years. I've been involved in track twos, which have been going on now for 15 years. Most of these dialogues emphasize the value of addressing the psychological aspects of disputes. And while they're not exactly secret, they're conducted quietly to allow outside the box thinking to flourish. Again, that's different at the track three level. They're not meant to be quiet. They're meant to be rather public. So, so those are the sort of the, the themes that when most people talk about track two, that's what they mean. That's what they're talking about in, in a brief form. So what are some of the possible results of this? Well, one thing that you have to bear in mind is that it's very, very rare for a track to negotiation or dialogue to ever lead directly to an agreement that's adopted by the governments. That happens almost never. Instead, what track two is really about is, is creating a sense of possibility, creating some space, creating some, some ideas that can be used um, to begin to change positions if the governments wish to do so, and that can begin to generate a sense that that new ways forward are possible. So what are some of the, the ways that track two works? Well, first of all, it can lead over time to change perception of the conflict and change perceptions of the other side. One of the things that I find in the work that I do in different parts of the world, in Asia and the Middle East and so on, is we often get the sort of, well, we know them syndrome. People say, well, we know that we've been fighting them for 50 years, we've come from the same stock, we know them. And in fact, they find that they don't. And they find that the, the, the underlying perceptions that each holds of the other are quite different. And so this, this is a very important and useful um, mechanism to allow them to discover that. It opens new channels for communication, sometimes where there were no before or very few. Um, the identification and development of new options for a future negotiation. Very often when you get into a deep-seated, intractable, long-standing conflict, the official position will be there's no hope. There's no partner on the other side. Uh, there's no uh, agreement, no possible agreement to any sort of set of, of, of proposals that we would find acceptable. We're just too far apart. And one of the things Track Do does is, well, wait, wait a minute. I mean, that's not necessarily true. If we, if we talk, we might find that there are some areas of, of common ground that could be further developed. And then preparing the ground for the transition of these ideas to the official track, and then developing networks of influential people who can work to change views in their countries, who can, who can begin the task of you know, going home after these meetings and saying to people in positions of authority or in civil society, depending on where they're active, you know, it, it, it's not the case that the people on the other side refuse to talk to us. And it's not necessarily the case that there's no ground for compromise. There may well be some issues that we can think about if we can just find a way to discuss. So, so that's what I've seen happen many, many times in track two. And, and generally people regard those as the, the sort of the, the, 
the results you would expect after a long period of time if you have a successful track two. It's very hard, of course, to categorize this. And so the field has difficulty sort of measuring and evaluating its outputs. And certainly funders sometimes ask, well, what exactly did you do? And well, we had this discussion and we new ideas were generated and it's difficult to quantify that. It's also important to note, I think, that, that these the dialogues can make things worse if they're done badly. And we do have cases of track two dialogues that actually worsened a situation by um, um, reinforcing stereotypes or leading to frustration or to a, a heightened sense that no way forward is possible. So there are there is risk and that needs to be acknowledged as you go into this. And you need to think about that as you do this sort of work. So because I'm an academic and academics need to define things, that's my definition for what it's worth. I'll leave it up there for a moment. And I tried to make it rather broad. And I tried to say, look, there are a variety of different things going on here. It's not necessarily track one and a half. It could be track three, but it's some effort to bring people in a conflict situation together to have a dialogue and to sort of explore ways to resolve problems or differences over, over issues between them. So that's my blindingly fast review of track two. What I'm now going to do is go into sort of the, what I think is the meat of my dialogue, my, my presentation here, and talk a bit about where I think the field is going and some issues that are arising. So one way to try to define track two and think about what it tries to do is to look at the, the, the objectives that a dialogue has with respect to what sort of influence it wishes to have over the conflict. And generally speaking, in the conflict resolution field, we talk about three levels. We talk about conflict management, conflict resolution, and conflict transformation. And conflict management is about taking a situation where it's likely that there's very little chance of a peace agreement, but there is perhaps the possibility for you know, a ceasefire, for some agreement to sort of step back a little bit to, 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 to reduce the fighting um, and try to manage the conflict so that it doesn't at least get worse. And it tends to be about the elites. It tends to be about those doing the fighting. Um, and it tends to be a sort of a dialogue to find ways to mitigate the impact of this fighting. Conflict resolution, as the name implies, is about coming to some sort of agreement to resolve the conflict, which requires that the elites sometimes have to get out of the way, because sometimes they're the ones who benefit from the conflict. And then finally, conflict transformation is really about transforming the basis of the conflict, the basis of society. Uh, and it may well result in a change in the elites and the respective societies as, as the situation changes. So when you do track two, in addition to saying, well, am I doing track one and a half, track two, track three, what kind of track two are you doing? Management, resolution, transformation. It's very much necessary in your own mind to, to clearly understand what it is you're trying to do who you're bringing together for these dialogues, why it's sometimes referred to in the field as having a theory of change, a theoretical proposition as to why a certain kind of dialogue with certain kinds of people run a certain kind of way will produce uh, a change ultimately. And so one way to represent this is to take that uh, figure I had a few moments ago and, and superimpose these three tiers, management, resolution, and transformation. And so you see here that most Track two, which goes on in the kind of track 1.5 space, is about conflict management. And then conflict resolution, and then down at the other end of the scale, conflict transformation tends to be what is being discussed there. Now that's not graven in stone. Sometimes at different levels, you could be talking about different things, but that, that tends to be the, the, the way these things shake out. And because of that, there is an emerging discussion in the field about whether or not conflict management, and even to some extent conflict resolution remains something that civil society dialogues should be engaged in, or whether conflict transformation uh, is the only acceptable way forward. And so there is this emerging agenda, which says that um, these dialogues must be inclusive. They must bring in uh, those who are do not have a place in official peacemaking. And that, of course, tends to be civil society, women's groups, um, other sort of ethnic and religious minorities who are not part of the elite. So one of the roles of unofficial dialogue, conflict resolution dialogue, is to bring these people to the table and give them a voice. Another argument is that it should be about diffusing two conflict-prone areas certain norms having to do with human rights, environmental issues, gender issues, and so on. 
Um, and it should sort of the, 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 the process of running a conflict resolution dialogue should have embedded within it the idea that, that you're there to diffuse these norms into a conflict situation. And finally, there's what's known as the local turn in peacemaking, which is, um, you know, these waves of highly trained outsiders like me run, running into the Middle East or Asia and running these dialogues is, is somehow illegitimate. And in fact, it has to be local people who understand the cultures better and so on, who do the majority of the work. So those are the kind of elements that not all people who are pushing this new agenda push all of these elements, but those together are the kind of elements of what is seen as the kind of emerging agenda in the conflict resolution field. And really what it amounts to is a pushback against the kind of elite secret track one and a half dialogues, which are often run by outsiders. And an argument that these dialogues really have to be sort of spaces for the inclusion of those left out and, and vehicles to spread norms, right? And so we sometimes in the field talk about the fourth wave of peacemaking theory and peacemaking research, and this is what's being discussed in that fourth wave. So that's the emerging agenda. And so the criticism that the emerging agenda has of more traditional forms of track one and a half and track two um, is that in helping the local elites to just manage their conflict without addressing its real conflict, real causes, which are often caused by the local elites in many ways, um, we're just reinforcing the power structures which sustain the conflict. We're, we're putting a Band-Aid on it and keeping the conflict going, right? And external actors, even if they're well-intentioned ones, are not really able to comprehend the situation and not really able to mediate um, and, and are in danger of importing kind of invalid norms into a conflict situation. But they also argue that certain norms should be imported. <laughs> and these are you know, human rights, gender issues, and so on. And it is the job of the third party to bring those into the conflict situation um, if key issues are going to be addressed. So it's much more a conflict transformation agenda than a conflict management, conflict resolution one. And that's really where we find the, the sort of the, the, the bulk of the discussion going on in the field right now. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm racing through quickly here because I want to give as much time as possible for discussion. But I mean, the idea that a focus on elite level secret track one and a half is not sufficient is not new. Going back to the beginning of the field and certainly several decades, people like Lederach and Galton and others and Burton have been arguing that real peace requires a multi-level effort. It requires efforts on the track one and a half, track two, and track three levels to work together and be coordinated. And it is wrong to just focus on track one and a half. And so people like Diamond and McDonald, who wrote a famous book in the field some years ago called Multi-Track Diplomacy, looked at this question of how all these different tracks can work together and, and reinforce and complement one another. And, and Hal Saunders, the late Hal Saunders, he had a concept called circumnegotiation, which was somewhat similar. So it's not new. But what is new is this push to an agenda which, which is about the role of these dialogues as instruments of social change uh, and norm diffusion. So again, it's not enough just to manage or resolve conflicts. The economic and social situation which sustains them has to be transformed through dialogue and advocacy. And this requires um, uh, unofficial diplomacy to push track one towards peace agreements which promote new norms and are inclusive. And that's really the heart of it. But it raises a problem. I mean, for all of the different um, ways in which we go about our work. And I confess, I do most of my work at the track one and a half level. I have, that's been my sort of particular area of focus. And for all of the ways that we go about that, this agenda poses challenges. For example, it is generally regarded as being necessary that the, the third party be impartial, that you run the dialogue in a way which is impartial and allows both sides an equal opportunity to make their points and that you don't take a side as the third party. But this is difficult with this new agenda. And I put up this quote from Eileen Babbitt, who's a leader in the field, and I think really captures it beautifully. Because what she's talking about here is the fact that impartiality means very different things to human rights proponents, for example, and conflict resolution workers, right? To, to a conflict resolution practitioner, impartiality requires an even-handed treatment of the parties regardless of their status, their resources. But for a human rights advocate, impartiality refers to the application of human rights norms, impartially, to both sides. But most of these norms are constructed to protect the weak from the strong. And so the human rights result 
really doesn't appear impartial. It looks like, and it often is, advocacy for one party over another. And it present, this, sort of, this, this approach to the question of impartiality presents a conundrum for people who work in conflict resolution because, I mean, we recognize, of course, that social justice requires a more active playing field, but, but we need to, we feel, maintain an even-handed approach to be credible as conflict resolution practitioners. So it's, it, these are the, and if you go through the issues of, of track two and how you run these and how you facilitate, one by one, you see these conundrums coming up with this agenda, which is, which is now um, very much part of the field. And so in my own mind, to try and separate this out, I constructed this thing, which I call sort of an impartiality matrix. And if you look at the bottom axis, it's a question of how sensitive or partial the third party is respecting the actions or the conduct of the conflicting party as they relate to different norms and values, human rights, gender, and so on. And then the, the, the vertical axis on the left side is about the partiality of the third party with respect to the positions that the conflicting parties take about the issue under discussion. So to take an example, for example, if, if, you, if you say that I as the third party, um, I have no real interest, in, I could, could care less who gets Kashmir between India and Pakistan, I really don't care. I don't, then in that case, I have a low level of partiality on the, the vertical axis, but I am particularly susceptible to anybody who uses force against civilians. I have a high level of partiality on the horizontal axis. So what this diagram is showing us is that sort of the classic track 1.5 facilitator is generally in the, the lower left-hand box. You're prepared to become involved in disputes without a significant concern for the positions or the actions of the parties. You're, there, you're just there to facilitate. And you don't take a position on, you know, you may personally abhor the fact that violence has been used against civilians, but you don't let it influence how you do your job. And so, and, and you don't have a particular concern over who gets, how you split up the pie that's being argued over. And then on the top right hand, left-hand side, excuse me, you can have people who might favor the position of one party, but will have a low sensitivity to the actions. I mean, I may think that one side or the other should get more of the pie, but I still don't care much about how they've acted, or I will not let it affect my facilitation. But where the field is going is it's pushing over to the, to the right-hand side of the, of the spectrum. And so the lower right, you have a third party who is sensitive to the actions of both parties, i.e. human rights violations and so on, but not particularly partial to the question of who gets what piece of land. And then in the upper right-hand box is the, 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 um, the, the place where most of those who are the advocates of the new agenda say we should be going, which is to be partial to both. I'm very partial to... The, the conduct of both parties, how they have acted with respect to these norms that are very important to me. Um, and I'm also partial to one of the other side in terms of you know, who should get more land or who should get more of the thing being debated over because they're the weaker party and I feel it's only just. And so that's the essential conundrum that we find ourselves in with this sort of new agenda. How do we, how do we sort of deal with that? And, and, and there are significant debates going on in the field. And so to go back to our triangle and sort of think about it now in terms of that impartiality matrix, as I said a moment ago, the track one and a half people are more inclined to be in the lower uh, left-hand box. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that we have a great deal of empirical research, a great deal of studies, which have made the point quite convincingly that a mediated solution to a conflict which doesn't address deeper social issues doesn't tend to last very long. Those are the ceasefires or the agreements that tend to break down because they tend to sweep under the rug the more difficult issues. Whereas a, an agreement or a peace agreement which actually addresses the hard issues, the hard social, political, economic issues, it's much more difficult to get, but it tends to last longer. So that's another element of this discussion is the sort of the people who say, look, conflict management, you may get a truce or a ceasefire, but it'll break down after a few years. And the response to that is, look, let's, first of all, let's get the ceasefire because people are dying we can save some lives. And then we'll find out, we'll see as time goes by, we'll see if, if this can transform the agenda into something deeper and richer. Others will say, no, you have to go for a, a transformative 
type of agreement, even though it'll take much longer and be much harder because that's the only really authentic kind of peace agreement. So that in a way is the crux of the debate we find in the field right now. And it's becoming rather intense amongst those who think about and write about and are involved in these kinds of dialogues, much more so than usual. So by way of a conclusion, and then we can get to our, our discussion. I mean, th this, this unofficial peacemaking space is getting crowded and it's getting messy. And there's a need to clarify the roles and the concepts, to rethink things like impartiality and advocacy and other traditional issues and to, to be much more deliberate and say, look, I'm doing a track 1.5. This is my conception of impartiality. These are the kinds of people I'll talk to. This is why I think conflict management in this case is the right way because of this. And to really lay it out in a much more deliberate way than we have up to this point. And conversely, if you are a part of the transformation, to, to lay that out and to say why. But more than that, I think that the, the question really is, can the, the traditional role of track 1.5 or track two coexist with this broader inclusion and norm diffusion agenda? Um, we have traditionally taken the view and people like Diamond and McDonald with multi-track and Saunders with circumnegotiation, that the various parts of this triangle should be working together in a holistic peace process. Nobody's quite figured out how to do it, but that's the objective. But what's happening now is that some people are saying, no, the bottom part of the triangle wishes to break away and do something different because it thinks what's going on up at the top of the triangle is wrong. And so this is sort of an either or quality creeping into the discussion in the field. Um, and, and we need to think about, you know, can we look for a way to bring track 1.5 and track three to a place where they really complement each other's goals? Um, this is gonna require a spirit of flexibility and the issues are becoming more and more absolute as people write about this. And I don't know if it's possible. And if not, then the field has to think about what's going to happen. And I'm my own concern is that the tracks are going to spin off into increasingly separate orbits and perhaps even somewhat antagonistic orbits. And that's something I think that we as a field in the sort of unofficial diplomacy, track two diplomacy, unofficial conflict resolution, whatever we call it these days, we need to think about that because it's happening and it's a worry. So I, I think you know, I will stop there and invite questions and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Peter, very much for really an exciting uh, and uh, stimulating discussion of um, waves and currents of thinking about how to do informal diplomacy best, especially in uh, conflict circumstances. Could I ask you to, uh, perhaps move out beyond the conflict area. Let's say dealing with problems that have not reached the threshold of conflict. And I'm thinking of what we call sometimes uh, civil problems that deal globally today with health or food supply, food security, access to clean water, um, similar kinds of issues. And, and in that non-conflict realm, how would how would the tracks work and what what is the relevance of this uh, discussion for those kinds of civil issues thank you i mean that's an excellent question and it's it's one that is being considered i mean the the organization i work with the ottawa dialogue we have actually this year a sabbatical research fellow who is a medical doctor he's a professor at the university of calgary medical school and does a lot of work in public health and he is looking at whether the, the kind of the techniques and the, the uh, um, ideas of track two could be useful in terms of some of the issues that arise in, in the public health field, where there's not a conflict, as you say, but there are differences of view over vaccination or, or whatever the case may be. And I mean, I think the, it's too soon to say, but I, I think the answer is that if you look, if you strip track two, the, the, the theoretical and, and the, the, the programmatic activity of track two down to its essence, it's about problem solving. It's about bringing together groups of people who they may or may not be in violent conflict. I mean, most of the thinking about track two has emerged from working with people who are in situations of deep seated violent conflict, but they have differences and they have serious differences, um, which they are having difficulty reconciling. And, and it's really an attempt on the part of a skilled facilitator to create a kind of a dialogue which takes them beyond, it's A, no, it's B, no, it's A, no, it's B, and much more into, well, what do A and B really mean? And why do we, are we attached to A and B? And is there 
something about these positions which we can discover if we look at them more rather than as bargaining positions, but rather as problems that need to be resolved. Can we discover some new thinking? And and so there's a there there is some thinking about how we do that. Um, I suspect that much of this is going to have to be done by people who are experts in the field of, you know, food security, public health, uh, relations with with different groups of people, um, than people like me because I probably am too old to learn new tricks. But maybe I can contribute my my sort of experiences and my thinking and my understanding of how problem solving dynamics work to that discussion. And I think it's, it's an exciting area. Thank you very much. And I, one more question, and that is these uh, various tracks or variations thereof in your concept, uh, that is your personal professional concept, are these working simultaneously? Are they communicating with each other? Is there a sequence among them that is supposed to be the best possible way to do this. What are your thoughts on that? Well, they should be working together and they should be communicating, but they rarely are. Um, and that is one of the reasons why people like Diamond and McDonald wrote their book on multi-track diplomacy and others have looked at this because, you know, as I say, we do recognize that there's a lots of studies and, and, and understanding that that a peace process, which is multifaceted, multidimensional, which involves multi-stakeholder groups, is likely going to reach a more durable and lasting peace than one which is just made by any one particular level of society. And so we do recognize that. But part of the problem we have is that, you know, for example, the, the at the track 1.5 level, there is a need for secrecy to persuade people who are close to their governments or maybe of their governments to come quietly and talk to a group of people whom, whom they've said they'll never talk to. You know, we will never talk to X. And suddenly they find themselves in a hotel room in Bangkok talking to X. And they can't, they can't admit that publicly because their position is they won't do it. And, and they moreover, they have sort of said, if we ever do get to talk to X, all we're going to do is reinforce our position. They need to hear what we think. And suddenly they're in a hotel room in Bangkok actually having a, a, a discussion, an exploration of maybe there are different ways forward. And so they're not willing to publicly admit that. And, and so that's happening on one level. And then at the track three level, you often have, you know, grassroots organizations and people bringing together civil society movements um, for the purposes of agitating for change, um, quite rightly so, quite legitimately, you know, and so, but the elites don't like that. And so the problem that we, we should try to find a way, and people in the field have talked about this for years, no one's really figured out how to do it, but to find a way to have those who do this sort of thing talk to each other and 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 have a little bit more interaction with each other um, in conflict situations. Um, again, it's just devilishly difficult to do because the, the, the requirements of the different kinds of dialogue tend to pull the two sides apart in practical terms. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn the program over now to Dr. Zanalda, who will be uh, presenting the questions from the audience from this point forward. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Pearson, and thank you, uh, Professor Jones. Uh, before I ask you questions from the uh, audience, uh, I have a just uh, because we mentioned about how to use track 1.5 or track 2 for uh, challenges that are not traditional security challenges in the traditional way. Uh, so I'm just posing you a very current uh, issue, which is vaccine diplomacy. Mm. Uh, so I'm not saying that you can solve that uh, right away, but what will be uh, based on your experience, expertise, and how track 1.5 or track 2 could help in uh, making sure that this uh, type of diplomacy will work even before the official diplomacy kicks in? You mean diplomacy within a society of those who are anti-vaccine and pro-vaccine? Is that was that what you mean by vaccine? I was thinking more about I was well, that could be also another idea, but I was thinking more about the distribution of vaccine around uh, the world, and that of course involves the WHO, it involves uh, pharmaceutical company corporations, mm -hmm. it involves how many vaccines have been produced and how many have already been sold to uh, yeah. some countries or some uh, people. So, what will be your take on this, if you, if you can say something. Well, my, 
my sense, and I'm not an expert in in the vaccine issue, other than you know waiting for mine. Yes. Um, uh, my my sense is that where we are right now in the next six months is probably not going to be affected by unofficial diplomacy. I mean, that just you know the, the system has to play itself out. But what we learn from it, and where we try to improve upon it for the next time, God forbid, um, could be an area where some informal discussions could be useful before people start to take hard and fast and graven in stone positions about this is how we do this. Um, and so I, I, you know, I would imagine that there'll be a lot of lessons learned exercises when all this is over with. Um, many of them for many governments will be extraordinarily uncomfortable. But I think that it's going to be um, it's going to be important to bring together the various stakeholders in fora, and they might be you know, sponsored by track one, but just quiet, or they might be sort of track two or track one and a half, where we can sit back and start to say, well, you know, what were our various experiences and perspectives on this last year and how the rollout of the vaccine happened and how it was distributed and how it was shared? Um, and can we begin to come up with some new guidelines, some new thoughts as to how that should happen? So whether it's done at the track one and a half level or it's done by governments, but quietly, I think that is going to be some sort of a problem solving approach to figuring out how to do this better next time. Thank you. And uh, I'm uh, collecting some questions. Uh, there is a question from Jeremy Cornu. To what extent it is necessary to meet physically to do track two diplomacy? Can it be done? Can it be done online? If not, what does physical meetings bring compared to online meetings? It's an excellent question. And of course, right now we've had to try and figure that out uh, very much. We've not been able to have our meetings. So in the work that I do, the Ottawa Dialogue does, we have a series of working groups, um, for example, between India and Pakistan on one of our projects, between Israel and Palestine on another. And they generally meet two, three to four times a year. And they have an agenda of work that they're doing. They're developing papers. And between the meetings, they they take these papers home, the drafts, and exchange them with the government officials and get comments and thoughts. And, and so it's an iterative process. But it really depends upon in-person meetings because we find that the ability to really sort of dig down beneath long-held positions, it happens just as much in coffee breaks and over meals, and perhaps even more so than it does around the table itself. And with this kind of a of a, of a format, you 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 miss that. You don't you don't get that. So I'm of the view that it's essential. Now what we have been able to try to do in the last year is to to sort of keep these dialogues going. And people have been thinking about it. We have some if you go to our dialogue, Ottawa dialogue site, we have some papers on this idea of working these things in situations where we're reliant on these sorts of mechanisms. And you can certainly use them as mechanisms of information exchange. You can use them to maintain relationships. You can use them for quieter work amongst specific individuals. Maybe the whole working group won't meet, but maybe one or two from each side might meet to work on a proposal or work on a paper uh, in this mechanism. But I, I'm not sure you can use this mechanism to really run track to um, um, as, as it's been traditionally thought of. It really does require personal contact because a lot of it is about breaking down psychological inhibitions and barriers. Thank you. Uh, another question from Kristen Angel. Uh, since there are many organizations that engage in facilitating track to dialogues, does each have a unique way of going about it? Have some organizations overall done better at implementing track two and had a larger impact than others? Mm -hmm. It's a good question, and I mean, there is a, a there are a group of these organizations. We belong. The Ottawa Dialogue belongs to one such sort of grouping called the Conveners Community of Practice, and there's about 30 organizations which belong. We meet annually. We exchange best practices. We do little research projects together. There are other communities like this uh, in Europe and elsewhere, and so you know there is a, a body of, of of organizations who do this. Um, it's important though, when you say, well, who does better than others is to sort of, well, you know, some are doing track one and a half, some are doing track three, some are doing some sort of hybrid. So when you start trying to break down the, um, the field, you quickly have to start introduce because you can't compare apples and oranges, right? Um, I think that those organizations which have tended to do better than others have been, first of all, around for a long time. Longevity matters, reputation matters. Um, 
prioritizing facilitation over all else matters. Um, an approach which, which also recognizes that one has to continuously improve and, and do research. And so many of the better organizations or the ones which are more um, uh, widely regarded in the field have a research facility within them as well as a sort of a facilitation and their research is supposed to guide their action and vice versa. So as I look at the field and look at various different organizations in it, those are some of the things I look for when I'm looking for an organization which is sort of, in my view, uh, in the top rank at, at these various strata of, of the field. Thank you. Uh, connected to this, there is a question about is there any applicability of these disciplines to the current intense political divisions at the, in the US today? How might they be applied? Um, I, as an outsider, it's difficult for me to answer that right off. I mean, I think that the, again, the, 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 the priority on dialogue and the priority on, on finding those people from in a deeply polarized situation who are willing to sit and talk and are willing to respectfully listen to the side and are willing to, to uh, accept that in the end of the day, no one can win 100%. You can't have a zero sum approach. And so I, one of the concerns I have, not just about American politics, but about politics in many countries is that the, the media is always focusing in on those who take the zero sum approach because it's sexy, it sells papers, it's, it's confrontational. Um, and I think it's a question of accentuating those people who say, well, yes, I have my view. I'm on the left or the right of the spectrum. But, but I mean, I, I understand and recognize that what the function of government in a democratic society is to reconcile different points of view, not to have them beat one another up until one wins and the other loses. I mean, ultimately, governments work when different political parties kind of compromise on things. And so um, whether track two as such would be useful is difficult for me to say. I think though that the, the broader conception of problem solving is, but I suspect it'll be on a sort of a micro scale in different places across the country in different situations, making it work on a macro scale might be rather difficult. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, certainly based on uh, some of your experience. How do tracks of diplomacy change or how strong is the record of effectiveness in dealing with conflicts regarding religious disputes? Mm -hmm. I would imagine in places with long historical conflict uh, like Israel and Palestine, there would be less willing willingness to even get into a room and discuss their goals because ideologies and regaining territory are held to a higher value than making concessions. Do you see the diplomatic discussions as ever being transformative rather than temporarily managed? Uh, yes, I, I do. I, and in fact, Israel-Palestine is one of the, the areas where there's been more track to than most others. Um, and, and we found that, that groups of people, including religious leaders, have been willing to sit and talk quietly and try to understand each other, um, even as they're in the midst of this conflict situation. Now, there are those groups, you know, I mean, the sort of ultra hardliners of either side who do not wish to sit and talk. That We understand that. But there are sort of removed from that still groups of people whom one might call, quote unquote, hardliners or absolutists in various ways who in fact are willing to sit and talk. And we have many examples of, of cases. I mean, for example, one of the more successful examples of historically of track two uh, was in Mozambique in the 1970s. There was a terrible civil war going on in Mozambique between sort of Marxist inspired rebels and, and a government and an organization of the Catholic church, the community of Santa Digio, which is based in Rome and is a sort of a lay Catholic organization We've gained entry to the conflict through the, the Catholic Church in Mozambique and was able to persuade people from both sides to come to these discussions and, and over time was able to play a, a role in helping to transform positions and transform views on the part of those in conflict. It's a, and it's been well documented. If you look up Mozambique Track 2, you'll find a number of different articles um, which talk about this. It's quite an interesting case. There's a very interesting case in South Africa. Many people don't know, but in the, in the sort of period leading up to the release of Nelson Mandela from prison, uh, when the South African apartheid government was saying, we will never talk to the ANC, the African National Congress, they're terrorists, there were Track 2 talks going on in Britain sponsored by a British corporation uh, to bring together leading members of the African National Congress, 
and people who were um, not governmental, but they were leading Afrikaner citizens to begin talking about is a new South Africa possible? And some of the understandings and ideas they put forward contributed to the to the um, the relaxation and ultimately the end of apartheid. So we do have examples of this sort of thing succeeding, but it's very long term and it's much more of a kind of a contribution to changing a, a mindset, to changing, um, uh, to creating a sense of new possibilities in a deep-seated conflict situation than it is necessarily to negotiating the agreement. It's it's a misnomer to think that track two is about sitting down somewhere and secretly hammering out an agreement. That's what governments do. Track two is more about creating the space for that to ultimately happen. Thank you. Uh, another question, and there are several questions around this theme. Uh, your point of the crowded and crowded and clear track to space. How do you suggest that the field shares information about ongoing initiatives while maintaining the dis discrete, confidential nature of these dialogues? Yeah, I sometimes joke we need a track two for track two. We need a space where the people who do this at different levels can go and talk to one another in a sort of non-attributable uh, way and in a, uh, a way which um, does not start from a premise that one approach is better than another and in a way which allows them to begin to exchange best practices and views. And so this group, the, commu the Conveners Community of Practice is trying to do that. There are others. Um, I'm not sure if it's better to organize these on a sort of a, a, a community-wide basis or to, to pick a particular conflict to say, look, there's a conflict in country X. So all those who are working in that country, whatever level they're working at, should sit together. Sometimes funders actually require this. They say we're funding organizations at different levels. They should talk to one another and try and um, share best practices. But I think that we should invest much more time in that. And we should invest more time in, in a discussion which um, is um, which, which more mutually respectful of the different agendas that are going on, even as we may disagree with some of the agendas uh, across the tracks. Thank you. Uh, this is a question that goes back to um, part of what uh, Ambassador Pearson asked and also when I asked about vaccine diplomacy. So this is from Chris Lara. Um, he's asking, what's the impact and leverage of digital technologies in designing peace building interventions and choosing the right diplomacy tracks? From your research, can you recall some best practices, participatory methodologies and digital technologies to address challenges in peace building in a dramatically changing world? Um, I think the field is so new, I'd be hesitant to talk about best practices. Uh, I will say that sort of based upon my own experience of the last year, and before COVID, we didn't use digital technologies. We, we relied on in-person meetings. We used technology, email, and all the rest to set up the meetings and all the rest of it, but, but we relied exclusively on in-person meetings. And so I think for the kind of work that I do, which is more track 1.5, we need to give much more thought to how these kinds of technologies can support uh, in-person meetings. There's so more work between meetings, bringing together smaller groups, but there are limitations. I mean, one of the reasons why many of our participants are reluctant to have the same kinds of interactions online as they would in person is security. They don't know who's listening. They're, they're much less willing to have a um, um, significant discussion where they actually really get into some deep-seated positions and they, they expose some thinking that they would rather have not made public on a medium like this because they simply don't know who's listening in. And you can invest in all kinds of virtual private networks and all sorts. We know that government agencies which are dedicated to, to, to sort of electronic eavesdropping can defeat those. And so... We've been told a few times, particularly we have a dialogue, for example, um, between India and Pakistan, which is focused on the nuclear issue, nuclear confidence building, sort of having people who used to be in command of the respective nuclear forces of the two countries come together and talk about you know, crisis escalation and things like that, doctrines and so on, to try and better understand each other. And they just point blank, we're not going to do that on this medium. We just won't. Um, we'll do it in a hotel room somewhere. We won't do it. So we, we have that limitation. Um, um, and we just have to work around it, really. 
Thank you. Uh, this is from another um, attendee. Any insights about how a track two could engage a hardcore abusive party with little predisposition to negotiate, say a violent army? Do we need different approaches for these difficult, difficult cases? Um, I've always maintained that there are probably some people who are beyond the reach of track two because they are so um, ideologically or religiously extreme that they're not prepared to have the conversation, to sit down. I mean, what you need around the table in a track two for it to work is people who may be hardline. They may be very hardline, but they are also at least willing to sit and listen to the other side, you know, put forward its view and expect the other side to listen to them and engage in a discussion about why that point of view matters, what's really the underlying cause of it. Um, and the absolute ultra hardline extremists tend not to be willing to do that. But I've also experienced a number of cases and others who've worked in the field where people who might once have been hardliners are capable of, people are capable of evolution, right? And, and there are many cases in the track two literature and experience of people who at one point in their lives said that they would never talk to X or Y, they would never engage in a discussion over these issues, their position, who changed? And, you know, again, another example of track two or sometimes back channel diplomacy is, I mean, for many, many years, there was a dialogue going on between the British government and the IRA. And it was done via intermediaries and it was done via back channels and it was, you know, arm's length removed and trusted individuals who were close to government but not part of it, all the rest of it. And many of the people who were at the heart of the IRA and other, you know, of the, the, the unionist movement who ultimately came together to sign the Good Friday Agreement had been people who said they'd never, it was inconceivable they'd ever compromise. And yet over time, through dialogue, through discussion, they came to see that, you know, the A, the other side had a point, but B, nobody could win. I mean, I think one of the things that really, I mean, if you are religiously or ideologically disposed to believe that winning or losing is not the issue, it's continuing the fight. And if it takes us seven generations to win, then we keep fighting. I mean, if that's your view, then you're probably not going to work in this. But if you are willing to sort of evolve in your views of what winning and losing means, then this can be helpful, it can work. Thank you. Um, based on your experience, how accurate would you say is the criticism that third party mediators do not fully understand the scope of certain problems? It's probably very likely. <laughs> I, mean, I would never imagine that I can go to an, a foreign culture and a foreign country and a foreign language and just understand completely um, what is going on. And But I think that, you know, one of the things that we do as facilitators is we can use that. I mean, we can very carefully um, ask questions. It's called making, you know, process observations or content observations, really to try and bring out their understanding of these issues. Because very often we find in situations of conflict, over a long period of time, people on either side have, they've, they've, they've crystallized complex, sophisticated problems down to a single word which they just throw out and say, well, that's it. You don't understand, and, you know, when in fact, they, what they need to do is unpack that and, and do so in the presence of the other side. I mean, I remember I facilitated over the years a great deal of Iran US track two in the years leading up to the JCPOA. We had several projects with Iranians and Americans. And during some of our first meetings, when we were beginning to get people together to talk about this and, and you know, the Iranians kept saying, okay, first, the problem is that you Americans, you don't respect Iran. You know, and the Americans are, yeah, yeah, we respect Iran. We respect you. Now, how many centrifuges, what level of enrichment? That's what we got to talk about. And the Iranians would say, if you don't respect us. And so finally, at one point I said, well, I think our Iranian friends should explain to us what they mean by respect. And that led to a day long conversation where the Iranians tried to explain this very deep seated feeling that the United States and the West generally simply doesn't accept. The Islamic Revolution and never will, and that there's always going to be an agenda of trying to overturn the revolution. Um, and until the Iranians feel that that is not the case, a genuine rapprochement, certainly with the Iranian government, is not going to be possible. And and I think the, Ara the Americans have found that very interesting. So 
it's an example of using one's own ignorance, but in a very calculated strategic way to get them to open up to each other. And that really is one of the tricks of facilitation. Thank you. And this is a, it's connected to this one uh, from Daniel Corser. Uh, how do traditional tax tools and the emerging thinking you described decide on which stakeholders to include in a track two or three? Doesn't a multi-stakeholder have effort become unmanageable at some point? Yes, I mean, that's a very good question. And I mean, that comes back to the, you know, the level at which you think you're working, um, your theory of change, whether you're thinking about management or transformation, a variety of different issues come forward as a, as a third party when you're sort of setting up one of these. And, and there's an exercise we go through, which in the field is sometimes called conflict mapping. You know, you map out the conflict and you map out the different levels of the conflict and you map out where you think you might be able to make a difference and you map out why, what kind, what, what kind of dialogue do you think will be important? What kinds of people need to be a part of it? And so from that, you, you, you get a sort of a, a broad sort of theory of change. This is what we're trying to do. This is why we're trying to do it. This is why we think it's important. These are the kinds of people and discussions we need to have. And then you go out and find whom you hope will be the right people. But again, if you're having one of these very quiet track 1.5s, it's going to be small. I mean, you're looking at sort of six people aside. You know, around a table. I mean, more than that, it gets quite unwieldy. Whereas a track three sort of civil society advocacy action, I mean, you're going to have large civil society groups coming together in large meetings at the grassroots level to, to develop advocacy plans for different different norms, different things you wish to to um, so the, the numbers are different and, and the way you go about it is different. Certainly in my own work, when I'm working with these things, I mean, I, after I've got a sense of what I want to do. I then go to the countries, to the region, and I talk to people on both sides. And very often, it's you know one is introduced by people who know those in, in authority, or one has previous connections from other work one has done, or whatever the case may be. Everyone has a reputation for doing this kind of work, and so you you gain access to that when you begin talking to people on both sides and trying to find those who might be the right participants. But it's a slow process. Recruiting the right people is a very important part of this, and it's understudied. Thank you. Uh, this is also uh, very relevant given your expertise and experience uh, in uh, different regions of the world. Are there geographical cultural specificities in Track 2 diplomacy? For instance, is Track 2 diplomacy in South Asia different from other Track 2 diplomacies? Um, yes, but not as much as you might think. I mean, there are obviously cultural specificities which affect how people interact, how they talk. Um, and there are also political specificities. I mean, one of the problems that we have, for example, in South Asia is that there is a very longstanding political, historical suspicion of outsiders becoming involved in regional affairs, particularly in India. There's this, you know, we will solve our own problems. We don't need outsiders. We've had that for hundreds of years. Uh, and so there is a certain level of suspicion um, of an outsider, so therefore one has to be very quiet and one has to not um, advertise too widely what one is doing and very much take the case that we're there to facilitate, but it is the conversation between the people from the region that sort of directs where this goes and how it happens. We're not an outside intervener that is dictating how this is gonna be done. You know, In other conflict situations, there may be a need for someone to be much more assertive and say, well, you know, we are going to sort of set up this thing and because the two sides want that. Um, so there are a variety of different things like that. And then, of course, there are the much deeper sort of cultural nuances about how people interact and, you know, high context cultures, low context cultures, different, you know, temporal understandings of time and the way it works. And, and so it, it becomes a very rich cultural menu that you have to navigate here. And, and it's incumbent upon you if you're going to do this kind of work to spend the time to understand, at least gain some level of understanding of these issues uh, and incorporate it into your conflict map. I mean, what is it we're trying, who are the people we're trying to reach out to and why? And why do we think it's necessary to include them? And what understandings do we need to have to begin to bring them into a useful dialogue? Thank you. Uh, this is a question has to do with public opinion, and there are actually two of those. 
thoughts on track two processes influencing public opinion in highly polarized situations and influencing inflammatory social media narratives, which I think it's even more relevant nowadays mm. with all the you know, different social uh, media outlets. Mm. Well, there's one good example I can give. There's something called the Geneva Initiative, which is a track two. It's Israeli-Palestinian and it's public and it's funded by the Swiss government and others. And it's a group of sort of leading uh, people from Israel and Palestine, most of them former high level government officials who've been involved in diplomacy and security issues for many years, many of whom have been involved in Israeli-Palestinian negotiations for many years. And they have come together and taken the view that one of the uh, impediments to achieving a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine has been that the opponents of such agreements on both sides has said it's impossible. You know, we can't get an agreement. We can't. There are issues of security that can't be resolved. And so they have sat down and they have said, we are going to negotiate the outline, the framework of what a peace treaty might look like. And we're going to continuously update it. And we're going to. And every time a politician says, well, that's that problem is not solvable. We're going to solve it and publish it and say, look, you know, we're not saying this is the. The, the, what should be the text of the final agreement, but, but the argument that these problems are insolvable is not true. They can be solved, and here we just proved it. And so it's very much aimed at influencing public opinion in that way. Um, so, I mean, that's a sort of an example of the kind of thing, but again, that's much more, it's a very strange one because it's sort of a track 1.5. And it's, it's elites, but it's not secret. In fact, it's deliberately not unsecret, and it's deliberately making its findings known. But that's a particular case in a particular circumstance. Thank you. Uh, another question has to do with how the process starts. How are the how are new track two processes initially set up? Are there best practices for reaching out to dispute, disputing parties and hosting a track two meeting, or do disputants have to initiate the process themselves? Yeah, I mean, I guess this is where I say read my book, but I won't do that because that's self-congratulatory. So, I mean, I, a lot of thinking has gone into this um, and, and there are numerous examples um, of how this is done. Very often, I mean, in, in any sort of longstanding conflict, there is some history, sometimes deeply buried, but some history of people talking across the line. I mean, very rarely do we have conflicts where in spite of all the rhetoric, no one has ever actually talked to the other side. And so you need to begin in some respects by finding those people. And sometimes they will reach out to you. I mean, I've had circumstances where the Ottawa Dialogue has become involved in a track two in a given region or a given bilateral dispute because somebody from wrote to me and said, you know, I read the book and I read your articles and I'm interested, could something be done? And so you enter into a conversation with this person and ultimately you go visit them and talk to them and, you know, get a sense of from them of people who might be willing to participate. And then, you know, you do your conflict map and you understand what might you be able to contribute. Um, and you have to find a way to reach out to the other side, sometimes involving sort of trusted third parties whom you know who will introduce you. And, and so it can take time. It can take a long time to really set one of these up, but you have to invest that time to do it carefully and deliberately. And then you've got to raise the money, which is, you know, it's not, it doesn't cost a fortune, but you do this money for airfares and hotels and, and you have to go to a funder and find the money. So there's a, there's a process that you go through. Um, um, and either I found either you are an expert in track two who is kind of contacted and brought into a situation, or you're an expert in a regional situation. And you begin doing track two sort of almost unwittingly because you're you're well known in the area. And very often I've had people who say, look, you know, I'm a great expert in this particular dispute or this particular, but I have no idea how to go about bringing. But, but I just know I've been told that there are actually people who'd like to talk to someone on the other side. I, I know who they are, but I don't know how to do it. You know, and then you sort of start talking with them and start working with them. So there's no single set definition of how you do this. It, it sort of, it evolves uh, uh, sui generis in each case. Thank you. Uh, this is another question that um, goes back to the issue of uh, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Do you think that T2 initiatives can be applied on issues regarding global commons, since there are not any parties directly involved, but rather states in the sense of stakeholders? And by the way, he says, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, Yoshi. <laughs> so. 
Um, I will have to say I don't know, because I don't know that field well enough. I mean, I would hope that in the field of global commerce, there's some space for people to go and have an informal conversation away from their, 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 their official positions and try to, on the margins of, of, of other meetings, work out um, um, ways forward. Um, I mean, I think, again, this idea of small problem solving group discussions and dynamics is applicable in many other uh, cases. I'm not sure, I mean, as you get further and further away from kind of conflicts as we've defined them in the track two field, you probably start to call it track two less and less and less. You call it more a sort of a facilitated problem solving discussion. Um, um, and I, I, think, I think those could be helpful, but I don't know enough about the issues of global commerce and the and the disputes to really know how and where. I apologize. Uh, this is a question from uh, Benjamin Smith. Uh, what are the challenges that may exist in engaging track to negotiation, negotiating stakeholders that are outside of the traditional diplomatic realm to take leadership roles in track to diplomacy discussions that might have a focus that touches on a multidisciplinary framework, say science or emerging technology issues that mm -hmm. might have thought leaders that may not normally engage in track to? or frankly, any diplomatic negotiations? Well, I mean, there's an enormous reservoir of experience of um, the scientists and engineers from across the divide during the Cold War coming together for informal discussions about the arms race and how they can collaborate. And in fact, there's a movement called Pugwash, which is an international NGO, um, which won the 1995 Nobel Prize or a share of it for the work it did during the Cold War, bringing together American and Soviet scientists to talk about ways to um, um, relax the arms race and which developed a series of ideas and proposals that over time went into or helped contribute to the negotiation of arms control treaties between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so, you know, there are histories of pugwash there's an excellent book by the National Academies of Sciences in the US called, I think it's Scientists, Engineers, and Track Two. It looks at sort of 50 years of cooperation between the American and Soviet Academies of Sciences. And so there is a rich history and a rich menu of, of this having gone on. And, and what we found is that very often when you have a group of people in a room who are, you know, engineers, nuclear physicists, doctors, whatever, but they have a common expertise, which is scientific. The, the national differences become secondary. They have a, a basis of discussion. They have a language they can speak in, which is um, unique to them, and it helps bridge divides. And they can begin then if with skilled facilitation to say, okay, the problem that we have is a problem of physics. It's not a problem of politics. How do we apply the principles of physics to, to resolve some of these issues or whatever the case may be? Now, we see this also in conventional, traditional track too. I mean, I get together regularly groups of people who are generals from two different countries at war or in conflict with each other. They're retired or even serving generals. And what you find is that they, you know, they're generals. I mean, they have a certain experience. I mean, their armies are different. They have a different sort of culture. And so, but they also have it. And so in political science, we call it an epistemic community, you know, a group of people who share an expertise. And as a skill facilitator, you can play off that and you can, you can help create bridges of understanding uh, by reaching across these communities. Thank you. Uh, there are several questions, but I know that we are running out of time. So I will ask a couple of more questions, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, one is from Mark Kabai. Uh, are there situations where track to diplomacy should not act? Uh, it, uh, as situations left only up to the government? You're freezing. Uh, could you hear me now? Giovanni, you froze on me. I... Could you hear me? I couldn't, you froze. The question was, are there situations where it cannot act? And then I lost you. Yeah, are there, okay. Are there situations where track two diplomacy should not act? Uh, situations left only up to the government? Um, I'm reluctant to say yes to that. I suppose there may be, but I always think there is scope for dialogue. I mean, I think there are situations where one has to be significantly more careful about how one goes about doing this. 
partly because of the risk to the participants. I mean, there are, have been cases where people who participated in these things went home and it came out and they got, they got hurt, you know, and they got killed in some cases. I mean, this is, this is, you know, you have to be delicate about how you do this. Um, I, I certainly, I mean, I don't believe that when two governments are deeply engaged in a negotiation and they're trying to genuinely trying to resolve an issue, I wonder sometimes if outsiders are that helpful. I mean, let them get on with it. But I think where there are situations where there's little or no discussion at the track one level, or the discussion is stunted and it's it's not productive, I, I tend to believe there's always some scope for a useful problem solving approach involving people near power, but not in it to try and see if there are new ways to understand the problem. Okay. And then this is a question that's more general and that is based on your views about diplomacy in general. Do you think that rethinking diplomacy or diplomacy can do without a dominant interaction? I'm sorry, could you say it again? Yeah, do you think that diplomacy can do without a dominant interaction? Dominant interaction, I'm sorry, what do you mean by that? Uh, I suppose that it's to have just one mm, dominant... Uh, oh, oh, one one level of diplomacy. Um, I, I, I personally would say not. I mean, I think that it, it is always important. It's important to, in most cases, accept that governments are governments and they're the only ones who ultimately can make treaties. And therefore, our job as track two or track one and a half or track three is not to usurp that role. It's to help open up new ways of understanding and new ways of thinking about problems, which can hopefully lead to changes at the official level and make, make better agreements possible. But we're not there to, to take over. I mean, I think that, again, this new agenda, which is emerging, um, some people might say, yeah, our job is to take over or is to so fundamentally challenge certain um, received wisdoms and certain dominant uh, actors and certain elites which are entrenched that we do bring about change. Um, maybe they're right. Maybe there are cases where that's necessary. But, but I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, in most interactions that I've been involved in, you, you ultimately have to recognize that governments will make decisions. And governments will ultimately be the ones who have to sign agreements on behalf of their people. You can try and influence that. Okay, Professor Jones, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, overview of uh, track to diplomacy and 1.5 and 3. And, uh, and uh, also uh, your experience and expertise are certainly great. A great asset for all of us, and uh, um, we have we had several questions. I, I didn't have the time to ask to to ask you all the questions, but they were revolving around uh, some of the issues that we touch upon. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, for those who attended today, in the invitation that we sent, uh, there are links to some of the readings if you have not uh, seen them, and we will also add those to the follow-up email that we will send to all the attendees uh, with um, some other uh, suggestions if you are interested in uh, reading more about track to diplomacy. Also, thank I would like to much. say thank you to Ambassador Pearson for the, the moderating and for his uh, questions and uh, and uh, to all the attendees who have patiently been here and we still have many of them. Uh, thank you very much for participating and uh, stay tuned for uh, future uh, programs. Thank you and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.